If you didn't get them, raise your hand, and Scott will be glad to help you with them. Everyone get them? Great. Great. Before I get started here, let me say something that I was supposed to say this morning. I even had it in my notes at the beginning of my sermon and skipped right over it. <clears throat> A week ago this past Wednesday night, Carol Barker was baptized into Christ. She is in the final stages of two different types of cancer. Hospice has given her a matter of weeks, but she was baptized into Jesus Christ. Now, if your first thought was late repentance is seldom true, I'll pray for you. And I will remind you that true repentance is never late. And it's something to rejoice in as the angels in heaven rejoice. But she wanted me to tell you what an encouragement you have been to her. The number of people that have contacted her, that have gone by to see her, that have uh, sent cards or called or whatever, she has been greatly uplifted by it. Uh, she was very much alone, separate from family and so forth, and uh, the things that you have done have been an encouragement to her, and that is indeed an encouragement to me also. So thank you for that, and thank you from her for that. These sheets that you're going to fill out, I don't know if you're aware of this. Our young people, every time I preach, have a, a sheet to fill out following the PowerPoint. Uh, they're used to it. You're not, so we'll see how you do tonight, uh, especially because this particular lesson, one of the reasons I wanted to have this in hand, uh, you to have this in hand, is because this particular chart is too detailed to show up well on the overhead, and I want you to be able to fill out the dates that I think may be helpful to you uh, as we go through that when we get to it. We're not there yet, but when we get to it. I love the song we just sang, Ancient Words. I did not become aware of that song until just a few years ago. Didn't grow up singing it, didn't know it, but it really thrills me when I'm about to get up to preach and we're recognizing the power of the ancient words. Not my words, God's words. Not my power, but His power. That's what we're looking at tonight as we begin to look at an overview of the Old Testament. First, it's a library. Second, it's a story. Third, it's a message. And fourth, it's the Bible. It is a library. 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. Stop and think about it this way. The Old Testament, if you go by chapters and count them and, and do the division and so forth, the Old Testament is 75% of our Bible. 75%. The New Testament is our law. There's no doubt about it. The Old Testament as a law has been taken away. Colossians 2 and verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances which was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The old law has been done away, and the New Testament is our law. But the fact is that the Old Testament is for our learning, and hence the title to this PowerPoint tonight. Romans 15 and verse 4, For the things written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. We're going to do something that I've not done in the past with this lesson tonight. We're wanting to look at the Old Testament as an overview, kind of an introduction to the Old Testament. I told Laura I was doing an overview of the Old Testament. She said, that's kind of ambitious. Yes, it is. And we've got a ways to go with it. But some might react by saying, Rusty, why are you doing this? On a Sunday evening, you know, the Sunday evening crowd is, generally speaking, we would expect a little more knowledgeable of Scripture and maybe not as much in need of an overview kind of a lesson. 
but can you share with someone the major dates of the Old Testament? Can you explain the different books and where they fit into the chronology of Scripture? Can you explain why they are not in chronological order in the Old Testament? The 39 books of the Old Testament break down as follows. The first are called books of law. There are, those are the first five. There are 12 books called history. That's the books of Joshua through Esther. There are five books of poetry. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. And there are 17 books that were written by prophets, men speaking for God, foretelling future events, and calling the people back to God. In this sense, it is clearly a library. But it is not just a library. It is also a story. It is not simply a collection of random writings. There is a plot to the Old Testament. There is a purpose to the Old Testament. There is a theme to the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 1, we are introduced to three different kinds of beings. God the Creator, the animals that were created, and man, who was created as the highest of the creation and given dominance and preeminence over the creation. In Genesis chapter 2, we're introduced to two specific characters, Adam and his wife Eve. In Genesis chapter 3, we are introduced to two specific characters that we haven't met before, Satan and the seed of woman that would someday destroy Satan. In Genesis chapter 12, the plot the theme begins to thicken. We see a man who is chosen by God and promised certain things. And this godly man named Abraham was told that it was through him that the seed of woman that would bruise Satan's head, that he would come. And the rest of Genesis is about the, de de the development of Abraham's family, leading up to Abraham's family becoming in Exodus a great nation. Now, as I said, I know that some of this you will not be able to read from where you're sitting. Major reason why I wanted you to have it in hand. And as we go through and fill out the dates and give us a kind of an overview of the Old Testament, I'm going to step to the side here, something I don't do a lot, so that I can use the pointer and point, make sure we get the right box with the right date, okay? Okay. We got it. There we go. This box here is pointing to the flood. It is 1656 years after creation. We can be very specific with that date because we are given exact ages of the people in the uh, the listing of who had children when uh, 656 years after creation, the flood happened. That places it somewhere around 23 to 2500 BC, maybe a little more. We don't have an exact date on that for the flood, but 1656 years after creation, and I have down there approximately 24 BC. Come on. Are we stuck? There we go. Around 2000 BC, right here, is where we see the introduction to Abraham. Again, that is an approximate date, but it is around 2000 BC. And remember, it's through Abraham and his family that would develop into a great nation that the seed of woman would come. The next thing that we see is that nation that had developed from 1.8 to 3 or 4 million people come out of slavery in Egypt, it's called the Exodus, and that happens, if you want to put a round number there, it's around 1500 B.C., but 
something like 1446 B.C. And then 1406 B.C. then is when they would have entered into the promised land. Remember, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. So there's a 40 year uh, time period there. And then about 1050 B.C. is when this nation that has taken the promised land, when they take their first king, King Saul. That was not God's choice, by the way. That was not his original intent, but that's what the people demanded. About 960 B.C. would have been when the temple was built by King Solomon. That was about 10 years into his reign. Remember that Saul reigned for 40 years. David reigned for 40 years. And then Solomon reigned for about 10 years until the temple was built. He reigned 40 years altogether. At the end of his reign... His son took over the kingdom, but because of some bad decisions, the ten northern tribes rebelled and the kingdom was divided. That was about 930 B.C. that the kingdom was divided. The northern tribes continued in sin, continued in idolatry until they were taken uh, away into Assyrian captivity. They were dispersed never to become a nation again. The southern kingdom, this is the line of the southern kingdom known as Judah. 722, when uh, the northern kingdom was, uh, was destroyed, never to become a kingdom again. And Jerusalem was destroyed. And this is a smaller box down here. You might not have seen it even as a box to be filled out. But uh, around 605 to 536, remember they had 70 years of Babylonian captivity. If you look that one up, you may come up with a little different date because there were different waves of people that were taken into captivity and different waves of when they returned. The temple would have been destroyed a little later than this, and it was 70 years between when the temple was destroyed and the temple was rebuilt. So how that 70 years was calculated exactly, I cannot say. But those are the basic dates of what's happening here. We want to remember what's going on. This nation is the family of Abraham, the chosen people of God. And they had been promised that through his seed, all nations of the earth would be blessed. But we see this nation sometimes obeying God's law and sometimes not obeying God's law. Sadly, they disobeyed more than they obeyed. We see that when they obeyed, they were blessed, and when they disobeyed, they were punished. But remember, there is through all of this the promise of someone who is coming. Someone who could destroy Satan. Promises were made in the Old Testament about where he would be born, That he would be a virgin, that he would suffer betrayal by a friend, that he would be beaten, pierced, and die as an offering for sin. The Old Testament story is a story of anticipation. Someone is coming. Of course, the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as we begin the New Testament, are that someone is here. And then the rest of the New Testament is that he's gone, but he's going to come back. Sometimes someone is coming again. But the story of the Old Testament is a cliffhanger. It's left, this theme that someone is coming is left unfulfilled, unfinished. The Bible is a library. It is a story. And it's important. Let me just point out to you on this chart that you have. All of the Bible books are named there. And I did give you a key to the different colors, but they're on the chart approximately when they would have been written, okay? They are not in chronological order in the Old Testament because they're divided up by their nature. The books of law and history are together. The books of poetry are together. The writings of the prophets are together. And so they're not in chronological order in the Old Testament. But this chart might be helpful to you in looking to see approximately when these books were written. And they're all there on the chart, I believe. 
We need to remember that the Bible, the Old Testament, is a library, it is a story, and it is a message. Think about this. The Bible was not written for our amusement. It is to direct us and correct us, not to entertain us. Now, that's not to say that we can't be fascinated by it. I remember as a small child, I don't remember exactly what age, but I remember for some reason I was reading in the book of the Judges. And I got so caught up in reading about the Judges and the various things they did, and especially when I got into the life of Samson and the things that I was so excited to be reading that story. We need to remember, however, that it's not simply a story. It's a message. It's a story with an application to us, with guidance for us. The Bible, even the Old Testament, is God's way of communicating with us, telling us what he wants us to know, telling us what he wants us to do, and how we can have a relationship with God. Him. Again, the Old Testament is no longer our law, but it still has a message for us. Romans 15, 4, of course, it is for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Think with me about 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 15, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. What is Paul referring to when he refers to all Scripture? That's kind of a trick question. We know that what they had as Scripture at the time was the Old Testament. This part is not tricky at all. There is no doubt he is telling us even in the New Testament age, that the Old Testament is profitable for us. That the Old Testament is part of how God is making us perfect and truly equipping us to all good works. Now, I believe that Paul, in saying all Scripture, is referring not just to the Scripture that Timothy had known from a child, but to that which was being written then. He knew that what he was writing was Scripture. Peter identifies the writings of Paul as Scripture. So they were aware that they were writing Scripture. And when he says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, I believe he has reference to the Old Testament and the New Testament that was being completed at the time. But that means that the Old Testament is profitable for us. That means there is something for us to learn, that it is part of what equips us to all good works. So let's consider some things from the Old Testament. Let's consider that the Old Testament, first of all, gives us history. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That is history. That is not a myth. That is not a legend. It is not a creation hymn, as some people want to style it. It is history. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All of Genesis 1 is history. The timetable in Genesis 1 is history. It is factual. The days of creation found in Genesis chapter 1 are literal 24-hour days. How do I know? Because God, to Moses, said so specifically in Exodus 20 and verse 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy for in six days... The Lord made the heaven and the earth and all that in them is. If that doesn't mean literal 24-hour days, then the Sabbath law meant absolutely nothing. These things are history. The story of Samson is history. It actually happened. The Old Testament, in addition to being history, reveals God to us. It tells us about his attributes. We can read in Psalm 139 about the omniscience of God. 
about the omnipresence of God, that he is everywhere and there's nowhere that we can go to get away from him or to hide from him or where he cannot protect us and help us. We read there about the omnipotence of God and how he formed us in the womb. The great power that that represents. The Old Testament reveals God to us by revealing God's attitudes toward us. In Psalm 34, verses 15 and 16, it says, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Does that sound familiar to you? Nod your heads. That's actually quoted in 1 Peter chapter 3. Where he says, he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, his lips that they speak no guile, let him eschew evil and do good, let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. But we were taught, mankind was taught that attitude of God toward good and evil, toward those who serve him and those who don't long before it was written in the New Testament. The Old Testament reveals to us moral absolutes. In Proverbs 6, beginning in verse 16, these six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. God still hates those things. Those are moral absolutes. They're not the only ones, but those are moral absolutes that don't change when the law of God changes. They remain the same, part of the new law, just as they were part of that old law just as they were part of the law given to the patriarchs even before then. We see in the Old Testament, we see predictive prophecy. Are there prophecies in the Old Testament that have not been fulfilled yet? Go like this. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty or the whole of man. But verse 14 says, For God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. That hasn't been fulfilled yet. But it will be someday. And I suspect there are other Old Testament prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled or are still in the process of, of being fulfilled. The peace that exists in the kingdom that's talked about in Isaiah chapter 2. That prophecy is still being fulfilled as we have peace among ourselves. And as we said, the Old Testament points us to the Christ. In John 5 and verse 39, Jesus said to the Jews, Search the Scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, he says. In Genesis 3 and verse 15, Jesus is the seed of woman that would bruise the head of Satan. In Genesis 12, 1 through 3, he's the seed that would bless all nations. In Genesis 21 and following, I'm sorry, 22, beginning in verse 1 and going down through the chapter. Jesus is the son of promise who had to be sacrificed. I remember the story there of Abraham being told to sacrifice Isaac, the son of promise. And how that foreshadows the Christ. But not only is he that seed that needed to be sacrificed, there was a ram caught in the thicket, right? Because God didn't want human sacrifice. And we learn the principle of substitutionary atonement and we see in that ram that was sacrificed instead of Isaac, we see Jesus Christ who was sacrificed instead of us. In Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14, Jesus is the I am. Remember? Who shall I say sent me? Moses said. God says, tell them I am 
hath sent thee. And in John 8 and verse 58, Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am. Not before Abraham was, I was. Before Abraham was, I am. In Exodus chapter 12, Jesus is represented to us by the Passover lamb whose blood protected the people from the destruction. In Leviticus chapter 16, as they're given the day of atonement there and how they were supposed to do it, Jesus is represented there by the high priest that's making the sacrifices. He is our high priest. He's represented there by the goat that was sacrificed for the sins of the people. And he's represented there by the scapegoat that the sins were laid, was laid on the scapegoat and he was driven away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness, bearing their sins away from them. Jesus is represented by that also as he bore our sins away from us. In the book of Numbers, chapter 20, Jesus is foreshadowed by the rock that was smitten for the people. In Numbers 21, he's the brass serpent that was lifted up so that those who were bitten by the fiery serpents, of course, that's the representative of Satan, right? Those that were bitten by the fiery serpents could look upon that brass serpent and live. And Jesus said in John chapter 12, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, Jesus is the prophet that was like unto Moses. Then Moses said, the Lord will raise up a prophet like unto me. To him shall ye hearken. Listen to him, he says. In Psalm 23, Jesus is the shepherd of the psalm. I take so much comfort in that. Jesus is the shepherd of the psalm. And everything that David said about how that shepherd cared for him applies to us in our relationship with Jesus Christ. So what do we have? The Bible, the Old Testament is a library. It's a story. It's a message that speaks to us and has an application to us. And we need to remember this final one. It is the Bible. Remembering that it's the Bible will help us in our approach to the Old Testament. Bob and I were talking about this and how daunting it can be if someone wants to study their Bible, but they never have before, and they pick it up, and they just begin reading at the beginning, which makes sense, right? I mean, but the very first book is 50 chapters long, and the Old Testament is 75% of the Bible, and it can be such a daunting thing. You know, the Old Testament has 929 chapters, 33,214 verses, 503,493 words, depending on which version you're looking at, right? 2,728,100 letters in it. That can be daunting, and reading it can take a while, and it may seem very foreign to us. It's okay if you nod your head here. We're not going to think that you're you're infidels because you sometimes have trouble reading the Old Testament. It is a daunting thing. I would urge you to have, when you're reading your Bible, have a good study Bible, not one that's given to a certain doctrine or agenda, but one that, as you begin a book in the Old Testament, will kind of explain where it fits in the Old Testament timeline and what it was about, what the theme of it is and so forth, so that you can gain more out of it that way. But if we can remember this when we're reading it, this is the Bible. This is God's message to us. There's some reason that he included this. There's some reason for me that it's here. And I can learn from this and it is profitable to me. Turn your Bibles, please, to Isaiah 55. We were talking about Old Testament prophecy that is still being fulfilled. Here's one in Isaiah 55. Verse 10. 
For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. God has a message in his word. And the word of God, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, is alive and powerful sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There is power in the word of God. And we can learn from it because it is the Bible. It will not return to God void. I don't remember who it was that said this, but someone was urging people to spend time with their Bibles to read. And he said, read, read, uh, read e even when you find it difficult. And don't worry if you don't have a bunch of commentaries to straighten you out or tell you what it's about. <laughs> he says, better is a little from God than a whole lot from men. Yes, it is. Because, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. And it will help to equip me to all good works. The Old Testament, the theme of sin introduced as early as Genesis chapter 3. And Satan introduced again in Genesis chapter 3. And someone that would come along and destroy Satan and take care of our sin problem. A theme in the Old Testament. A glorious thing for us to learn about and see as it develops. To believe in. And to see that our God not just wrote us a book, but he managed and manipulated all of the world and all of history to bring about those things that the word tells us about and promises for us. This makes it exciting to me. And I hope it does to you. I hope the word of God speaks to you on a regular basis. It's not going to happen by osmosis. It happens by diligence. It happens by a dedication to learning the word of God. Someone said it this way, Satan is after your heart. Nod your heads. Satan is after your heart. So fill your heart with the word of God. And Satan will not be able to get it. Fill your heart with the word of God. We're going to sing the invitation song. Could be that you need to respond tonight. Could be that you have not been baptized into Jesus for the remission of your sins. Or it could be that you were at one time, but you have not walked in the light as he is in the light. You have not continued to be faithful. Studying, growing, learning, following him. With every ounce of your being, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If you have a spiritual need, if you're not right with God, we urge you to come as we stand and sing.